Okay, I think that, that, that will do. So, uh, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Tony Burns. I'm one of the co-directors for the Centre for the Study of Social and Global Justice, and I'm going to be chairing this uh, evening's uh, seminar. I'm delighted to be able to say that uh, we've been fortunate enough to secure the services of Peter Horwood, who's a professor of modern European philosophy at the Centre for Research in Modern European Philosophy at, uh, at Kingston uh, uh, University. I'm going to shamelessly plunder the uh, the WikiLeaks page on Peter's biography. I, I hope he doesn't uh, mind, which says that he's a, a political philosopher best known for his work on Alain Badiou and Gilles Deleuze. He's also published works on post-colonialism and contemporary Haiti. He's a member of the editorial collective of the journal Radical Philosophy and a contributing editor to Angelaki Journal of the Theoretical Humanities. After completing his PhD at Yale, University in French and African American Studies, Peter became a lecturer and then a reader of French philosophy and literature at King's College in London from 1999 to 2004. He then moved to the Centre for Research in Modern European Philosophy, which relocated after some kerfuffle, I believe, uh, the politics of all this is quite interesting, I think, from Middlesex University to Kingston University, where he's now, of course, a professor. He's a regular con contributor to a variety of journals and uh, publications, including Radical Philosophy and New Left Review, uh, The Guardian and The New Statesman. Uh, I had a look at Peter's publications list, but there, uh, there's far too many uh, items there. There's about 140, I think. Uh, uh, so we'll perhaps just say a little bit of, uh, uh, about his books. Uh, he researches in three broad areas, uh, the, the history of political philosophy, political thought, um, but also, of course, 20th and early 21st century French philosophy, including uh, figures such as Deleuze, Badiou, uh, and Rancière, as well as uh, Jean-Paul Sartre and Michel Foucault. Uh, and he's also, of course, extremely interested in contemporary critical theory and uh, the politics, uh, post-colonial studies, I think, post-colonial uh, theory. Let's have a quick look at his uh, publications. Uh, Peter translated Alain Badiou's Ethics and Essay on the Understanding of Evil in 2001, and he's written a couple of books about Badiou, uh, absolute, uh, sorry, uh, Badiou, Subject to Truth in 2003, uh, <clears throat> and an edited collection, uh, Think Again, Alain Badiou and the Future of Philosophy. He's also uh, written about Deleuze, Out of This World, Deleuze and the Philosophy of uh, Creation, as well as a volume entitled Damning the Flood, Haiti, Aristide and the Politics. Uh, of uh, 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 containment. Perhaps more germane to this evening's uh, seminar, I think, is the fact that Peter's been involved in uh, um, a research pro project associated with the work of Auguste Blanqui, uh, which has been funded by the uh, AHRRC. Uh, and the Blanqui Reader, uh, which he's edited, uh, was published in 2018. Uh, if we go back to the first slide, the, the title of Peter's talk this evening is on, it's on Blanqui, it's called Taking Power, Reading Blanqui After Lenin and Martov. Peter's going to speak for about 40 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. That should give us plenty of time uh, for, for discussion uh, afterwards. Peter, I don't know if you've got a, a PowerPoint. Are you just going to speak? Um, no, no PowerPoint, I'm afraid. All right, just going, so, I, um, well, I, I'll, 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 end, I'll end my show and stop sharing and we'll, then we can perhaps uh, see each, each other. Yeah, that, 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 that's great. Mm. Okay, Peter, over to you and thank you very mm -hmm. much. Okay, thank you so much, Tony, and to Oliver also for helping to organize this, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. It's good to see uh, some familiar names there. Um, so I'm going to focus on um, Blanqui and in, in pretty broad terms, uh, and not uncritical. So there are a lot of problems with Blanqui and limitations, and we can go into them if you want afterwards, but I mainly want to focus on what I think is productive and useful, and so a kind of critical appreciation of him. and centrally on the question that he's obsessed with, and obsession is the right word, which is the question of power. What is power? In the, broadly, in that double sense you have in French of a general sense of capacity, so power in the sense of pouvoir, you know, what you can 
do, what we're capable of, in the sense that you can talk about what qu'est-ce que je peux faire, you know, what can I do, in all the various dimensions of that um, sense. And then more specifically and centrally politically, in terms of political power at, at its core, meaning for him sovereign power, state power, the power then to command and to govern or rule, which itself is based in the end on coercive power. When push comes to shove, Blanqui, no less than Trotsky or Lenin, thinks that the issue will be decided by the force of arms one way or another, or at least by coercive power. And he focuses on this, and, uh, and he does so in ways that I think are quite useful uh, for us, at least in two very broad, uh, broad terms. One historical, if you like, one um, that's still somewhat future or speculative. The historical one is that it allows, I think, a particularly fruitful and forceful angle of trying to assess, in a way, the great political question of the 20th century, the last century, which turned on the seizure of power, the paradigm is the, the Russian Revolution, October 1917, seizure of power coordinated by the Bolshevik party. What, what happened in that pivotal moment? Was it legitimate? Was it premature? Was it counterproductive? And where people came down on that question, whether they allied themselves with it, whether they aligned themselves with it, whether they opposed it, will say a great deal, I think, about what will happen in the next decades. And it becomes, in a sense, the great revolutionary question of the mid 20th century. Um, parenthetically, Badiou, Alan Badiou develops this quite usefully, I think, in his little book on the 20th century, called the, just called The Century. Really, the, the century then preoccupied with the question of power. And then for, for us, it, uh, who belong to a different century, of course, a different era, it, I think, asks or invites us to reflect on, well, what is our position on this question? What, what do we mean by power? What would it mean for us to take power? Is it a question that we can really address? Is it an abstract question? Um, you know, what, what would it mean, in fact, for us to take power in some way, to take the kind of power we need if we're to actually address the problems that face us, the problems that are literally destroying the world um, as we speak? Not just climate, but exploitation, global inequality, division of labor, arms race. I mean, the list is really overwhelming, as we as we all know. So, what would it mean to actually address this? What kind of power do we need to address it? Um, for Blanqui, his whole trajectory is, is oriented not by this futural speculative dimension, but by a very concrete reality that's already in the past, which was the French Revolution, and specifically the the climactic moment of the French Revolution, the seizure of power in August 1792, the 10th of August 1792, the single most important date in French history, I think, certainly for Blanqui, the decisive moment. And it's really that moment when a mass insurrection overthrows the monarchy, takes power, quite literally, inaugurates a new constitutional process, uh, and opens up a path that for Blanqui is certainly very incomplete and thwarted but a path that in different ways would be renewed in his own lifetime, starting with July 1830. So the July revolution, the, which is the single most important uh, event for Blanqui himself. And I'll say a few words about that. Continu continued then of course in February, 1848. And then with some other sequences along the way, uh, climac you know, kind of climactic culmination for Blanqui's followers at least in the Paris Commune of 1871. As you may know, Blanqui himself was arrested the very day the commune starts, so he's taken out of action. But his followers play a, a very important role in that sequence. Um, so that's, that's the kind of way of, of, of framing this. He, he addresses the question then of power in, in a way that's exemplified by that seizure of power in August 1792, which is to say a kind of assertion of mass sovereign power. And he does so in ways that both echo Marx and anticipate the, the revolutionary generation of Luxembourg and Lenin. They echo Marx very briefly because Marx also thought that although he's impressed like Engels and some of their contemporaries by the rise of the German Social Democratic Party in the late 19th century, the fact that they are becoming a real electoral force ultimately poised to win elections in Germany, He's nevertheless skeptical that merely parliamentary or peaceful uh, transition to socialism could really work within the limits of the status quo. Marx tended to think that 
if capital's grip was really challenged, there would be some kind of slave owner's rebellion, as he put it, of the sort exemplified by the Southern planters rebellion that triggers the US Civil War. So for Marx, when push comes to shove, class conflict will tend to degenerate into civil war because that's what the ruling class will impose. And for the same kind of reasons that people like Frederick, Frederick Douglass or Wendell Phillips, John Brown, Harriet Tubman, that whole generation of radical abolitionists all came to see war as the only way, in fact, of achieving abolition. So they echo with Marx and there are moments when Marx's uh, writings, particularly in his most revolutionary, so the, the moment that's really encapsulated in, if you know this text, in the March 1850 address that Marx helped to write, is Marx is really on the same page with Blanqui in a, in a lot of these points. There are other ways in which they're of course different, but it's important to see that there's a real convergence as well. And second, they anticipate Luxembourg and in particular Lenin with Lenin's own calls to turn class struggle and then an imperialist war, the imperialist war that begins in 1914 into a civil war between classes. This is a real theme that Lenin bangs on about. And in particular, Blanqui does anticipate Lenin's position in 1917 in a number of interesting ways. There are also some important differences too that we'll come to at the end. But briefly, when Lenin insists all the way through that year, when he, as soon as he comes back to Russia, that the key motif has to be to transfer all power to the Soviets. In other words, to the, the improvised popular councils that, uh, that, had been, that had grown up very quickly developed first in 1905 and then developed again very quickly at the end of February and into March 1917, transfer all power to the people, in other words, all power to the Soviets to end this unstable dual power that split sovereign power between the provisional government on the one hand and the Soviets on the other, and to work out the way in, in which this could be done that would carry commanding authority, that would allow the people who pursue this both to engage in the inevitable civil war that Lenin was getting ready for and to win it. So we'll say a, a little bit about the Russian sequence at the end, if there's, and there may not be time to do it properly, in which case, if that's something people wanna talk about more, we can uh, come back to it. But I'll spend the bulk of this then the next 20 or so minutes, 25 minutes talking about, about Blanqui. And again, in pretty broad brush terms, it's really, Blanqui is not a complicated thinker if, you, if uh, you're, 19th century revolutionary point of reference is Karl Marx, uh, as it is for me in many ways, uh, you will be in some ways disappointed by Blanqui for sure, and also perhaps relieved to see that he writes uh, in a very condensed, um, often extraordinarily concise way. This is partly because he wrote a lot in prison with very literally very little paper to hand, writes tiny little notes on the, literally the back of postage stamps and things like that. And his real focus is trying to get things down to a slogan, down cutting, you know, cutting, compressing, concentrating. It's also someone who grew up with Latin almost as a first language, and the concision of the syntax is something that he, you know, he's really struck by. But the first key point then is Blanqui grows up in an age of reaction under the counter-revolution, essentially, that takes shape after the French Revolution but also still with the memory of the revolution very much alive. So the, the world is polarized for Blanqui between revolutionaries and counter-revolutionaries. And that polarization has increasingly taken shape over the, his formative years as a class conflict. So he's emphatically someone who pushes in this well before Marx, the implacable conflict between a, the poor proletarian mass of people and a small exploiting class of capitalists or the wealthy. He talks about this repeatedly as a war between the rich and the poor. That's I think the main theme of his first political speech in 1832. And I'll just mention a text that I'd encourage you to read. So all of the texts that, I'm, that I'll cite uh, here are available on the, that website that Tony mentioned at the beginning, the Blanqui archive, uh, which you can find easily. Um, and I'll just give titles then and a few quotes. And if you want to follow them up, you, you can find them. They're also published in that reader, the Blanqui reader. Um, and I just want to mention here, because it's, it's interesting to compare Marx and Blanqui on this point, that he has a text, an early text from 1834. It's called Social Wealth Must Belong to Those Who Created, 1834. Again, you can find that if you want to afterwards. Um, where you could argue that in this short text, there's only a couple of pages, he 
uh, sort of anticipates what Marx will develop at length. Uh, it's his theory of exploitation on the one hand and his theory of uh, originary accumulation on the other. And basically says here that what's happened uh, in the shaping of this modern world that's now a fully capitalist world, the, the world of the 1830s, is that one class of people has monopolized property. He talks about it as a permanent despoilment is a process whereby one set of people has completely dispossessed the others of all the instruments of labor, stripped them of all land and capital and all resources and made them quote then utterly dependent on those who own the means of production. So he goes through this a little bit, talks about this monopolization, permanent despoilment and so on, which then maintains the bulk of people, the vast majority of people in a state of slavery, his term. And he says, if slavery does not exist in name, it exists in fact. The right to property, while more hypocritical for us in, here in Paris than it is in Martinique, still a slave state, a part of France or in ancient Rome, it's neither less insolent nor less aggressive. It's just as forceful. It just has a slightly different form. And that form is one of maintaining the vast majority of people as, quote, absolutely dependent on the owners of the means of production. And so he says, you know, what is, he goes on to develop this, you know, how does this happen? Well, it's through the, that originary accumulation, through the, the, the original conquest of land and means of production. And then by the way that these owners of production exploit the people who are forced to work for them and extract most of the wealth from these workers and keep it for themselves. So as he puts it, the, the vast majority of people, quote, find themselves forced to toil on land whose produce they do not reap and to enrich through their labor an idle minority that gathers up everything. The honey produced by the bees is devoured by hornets, end quote. And you have then, I won't labor this much further, but in this brief text, a kind of sketch of the, basic idea that Marx will develop, you know, at much greater length. But one difference between them is that for Blanqui, this is all self-evident, it's obvious. There's a tiny clique of people, they've taken possession of all the property, they force everybody else to work for them and they don't pay them for their work. Capital is the command of a, over unpaid labor, would have been a sort of self-evident insight for Blanqui and he doesn't belabor it very much. He doesn't spend a lot of time then developing the mechanics of this. He's not particularly interested in the the arithmetic of say the exploitation of surplus value or how you would maximize relative or absolute surplus value it's broadly all for Blanqui a kind of self-evident thing that everyone can see people are forced to work harder and harder more and more intensively for other people who, who reap the rewards of their labor for Blanqui what matters is what do we do about it and his whole focus is on then given this war of the rich on the poor given the exploitation given the monopoly of ownership of the means of production the poor, the great majority of people need to organize themselves to fight it and to defeat the wealthy few. And this is where, again, Marx and Blanqui are very much on the same page, I think, when there's an opportunity to do this. In other words, particularly for Marx, in the 1848 to 50 sequence. And if you look at that address to the Communist League of, eight, of March 1850, you'll, you'll see what I mean. Blanqui, is just as emphatic, the workers must be armed, they must be independent, they must be forceful, they must make no compromises as far as possible, and they must win. So a thing that Blanqui emphasizes is that if you're in a fight, if you get drawn into a war, and it's not that Blanqui always thinks that that's the right strategy, in fact, he often thinks it's a disastrous strategy and that people should resist the temptation to get drawn into a fight that they can't win. After 1848, after Already by 1849, he recognizes that it's not, it's hopeless in France for the moment. So he's constantly saying people should retreat away from kind of hot headed attempts to charge, uh, you know, at the government or to build barricades in a futile way. He emphasizes, no, on the contrary, we need to get ready and prepare. But when there is open conflict, then the key thing is to win. And that he, he reflects repeatedly dozens of times on the legacy of that moment in the history of the Roman Republic, the Vae Victis, where the Romans are defeated briefly by the Gauls and are forced to, um, 
to pay tribute and various other things to a victorious conquering army. And in a war, it's victory or defeat that is decisive. So I'll give you one quote that is one of the most telling quotes really about Blanqui, a lot compressed into it. It's from a text he wrote actually relatively late in 1871, uh, introduction he wrote to the, the, the Hébertiste faction of the French Revolution. It's a couple of sentences, I'll read it out maybe twice. He says, it must be stressed that it is victory that carries glory or opprobrium, freedom or slavery, barbarism or civilization in a fold of its dress. We do not believe in the fatality or inevitability of progress, that doctrine of emasculation and submission. Victory is an absolute necessity for right, le droit, on pain of no longer being right, on pain of becoming like Satan, as he writhes under the archangel's talons. So Satan rebels, he contests, he fights God, he loses. And as a result, he is literally demonized. That's the, the very kind of etymology of, the, of, the, of what happens to a figure like Satan, a failed revolutionary, if you like. Um, whereas the victors will rewrite history. They will have the, the, all the means to do so. They you know, rearrange um, the social order to match their victory. And Blanqui's life is punctuated by a series of failed revolutions that are usurped by the victors. The recurring figure of Adolphe Thiers um, and various others who usurp victory and remake society in their own fashion. And that motif, which will run all through the 20th century too, of course, exemplified maybe by the, the failure of the German revolution of 1918-19, is a thing that Blanqui anticipates quite powerfully, I think. We can also think for you know, lots of different contexts that the calamitous consequences of defeat, if you think about Arbenz in 1954 in Guatemala or Lumumba, 1960, executed in 1961, January 1961, and the incredible price to be paid for that, or Allende in 1973, we could multiply examples through to some of you will know Aristide in 2004. Each of these defeats has just catastrophic consequences for social organization, for the people, the partisans of these regimes. And for example, relating to the defeat of the Arbenz regime in Guatemala in 54, it's really there that Che Guevara and, and Castro and others um, solidify their determination to make sure that they will not be defeated and that they will do what it takes to win and on that basis pursue radical social change. That's very much in line again with Blanqui's assumption. So victory is critical. There's a, there's a war between the rich and the poor. And Blanqui's kind of bedrock assumption is that the, the poor masses, the great majority of people are prepared to fight that war and can win it. So when the opportunity arises, and that of course is something that's occasional and unusual, the poor can rise up and they can win. And this, this is really critical to, us, to understand about Blanqui. And the paradigm is July, 1830. He, he participates in this. He boasts, or I don't know if it's right or wrong, but he boasts afterwards that I was the first, he says, to bring a loaded rifle into the streets in the July days, the three so-called glorious days at the end of July of 1830. He stresses this, people remember it. He's in fact decorated by the government, the new government that comes in, Louis Philippe's government for his uh, glorious uh, courage and so on in July. It's the last time Blanqui ever got an official award by any uh, government. Um, but he, so he's very implicated in it, very involved in it. And he's very, very marked by the fact that the people win and they win in a pitch battle. And I do want to just go into this in a, in a tiny bit of detail because it's very important to understand Blanqui. Because, and just before I, I say that, 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 if there's a single thing that people remember about Blanqui or say about Blanqui, uh, almost always without ever reading Blanqui, is the idea that he's this kind of reckless putschist or adventurist, that Blanqui, what is it to be a Blanquist? Is to think that you could somehow take power with a dozen guys, you know, that a few people could charge at the, you know, at the, at the, the royal palace or its equivalent and somehow or other, you know, overthrow a regime with a tiny minority, a tiny handful of people. And that is, of course, ludicrous. And whatever else Blanqui is, he's not an idiot and never, ever thought that. Um, on the contrary, Blanqui believes in mass insurrection and he lives it uh, in July 1830 and it shapes his entire perspective. So 
there's not time to go through this properly, but it's the, it, it would reward um, study. It, the July 1830 is not as studied perhaps as it often should be, at least in these kinds of contexts. And without pretending to be at all a specialist of it, uh, what I want to just emphasize is that things came to a head. The, the, the government, the re re very reactionary government led by Charles X and his Prime Minister Polignac, almost a kind of buffoon type of character, take increasingly authoritarian measures until they eventually just resort to straight up authoritarian, effectively an authoritarian coup with the four ordinances they pass in late July. And this provokes a massive response, it, both a response among the progressive wing of the establishment, if you like, the big wealthy bankers and newspaper barons and financiers and the kind of liberal capitalist class, if you like, people like Lafitte and Perrier, big wealthy bankers. Grizo as well, the, the, the doctrinaire liberal free marketeer types. And it provokes a backlash from them because this is bad for business. It also provokes though a, a very different reaction, which is a mass uprising. And for three days, there's a pitched battle between the forces of order, about 10,000 or so troops led by Marshal Marmont, who an old Napoleonic general, and a, a mass of uh, tens of thousands of Parisians. And the, the Parisians uh, defeat three successive strategies. So I'll just briefly mention this. The Marmont tries to do, tries to pacify the city in three ways. First, on the first of these glorious days, Tuesday, Tuesday, the 27th of July, he sends his troops out all over the city. So in small groups, take over virtually everything of any significance, guard posts all over the place, the major buildings. Uh, and this backfires right away because many of these groups just defect or there's fraternization and they're won over. And in large numbers, uh, many of these soldiers just don't come back to the barracks and go over to the people. Or else in some cases they're overrun, the numbers are too small. So that's Tuesday, bad start for the government. The next day, Wednesday, 28th of July, this is the really decisive day in July, 1830. Marmont, so the general in charge, changes strategy, concentrates the troops in three major columns and sends them to what he thinks are the kind of pivotal strategic points in the city. And one then goes to the Hotel de Ville, the, the um, town hall, uh, sort of an Eastern uh, part of town. So central East, if you like, to take control of that. Another goes further East to the Place de la Bastille, so where the Bastille castle used to be. And another more central goes to the Place uh, Joachim du Belay, which is by Les Halles and Châtelet, so if you know Paris, right, pretty much in the center. So he sends out these columns of thousands of troops each, and they all get pinned down, barricaded, and overwhelmed by the mass of Parisians. They have to fight their way through and out, and are, in particular, that one that goes out to the Bastille, tries to get back to the Hotel de Ville, and is twice forced to retreat. So they come up against a barricade, there's a you know, firefight and they have to retreat in, in fact, in sort of relatively poor order. The second time they try it, they face seven barricades in a row over a couple hundred yards. They get through a couple and then they run into one they can't break through and they have to just literally just retreat backwards, go south, cross the river somewhere else, come back to the Tuileries. So it's a complete fiasco. These three, all three of these columns have to retreat back to base, which is the Tuileries Palace, the sort of headquarters. So the third, and by now, uh, the calculation is that literally thousands, about 4,000 barricades have been thrown up. The whole city is turned into an armed camp. The government cannot control it. So they pull, Marmont now, the general, pulls all the forces back on Thursday, back to headquarters, back to Saint the Tuileries Palace. So the third strategy is just hold up in the Tuileries Palace and try to keep it and hope that something shifts or that reinforcements come in from the provinces or that something happens, will give the government a chance to retake the initiative. But this fails too, when the mass of Parisians attack the building and the pivotal force here, the Swiss guards who had played a, a role for a long time in French, guarding the French royal family panic. Their ancestors probably in many cases had had an experience of a similar assault back in the, the August, 1792 and didn't want to meet the same fate, they panic and flee out the building. And as they do that, the whole army collapses. The whole, the, what's left of the army also panics and they literally kind of run down the Champs-Elysees and towards the Alto Triomphe and then out of Paris. And by the afternoon of Thursday, the 20th of July, the French people control Paris. They control all the major buildings and really that's the end of the sequence in fact. 
Um, and this then is for Blanqui definitive. The people have this capacity. They're organized, they have the courage, they have the capacity to use the weapons. They have, at this point, still enough Napoleonic veterans of the wars, only ended, of course, 15 years ago, who know how to use them, who know how to organize people, and they have this capacity. So that's really critical. Whenever Blanqui launches an insurrection, and he does try this a few times in his life, it's always on the assumption that there is a mass of people who will rise up and fight and can win if they think it's a plausible strategy. In other words, if they think that there are, there's an effective leadership, that there's a proper plan, that the cause is right, that the circumstances are good, uh, et cetera. That's Blanqui's assumption. That's what makes him so relentlessly, if you like, optimistic about the capacity for mass insurrection. And he believes that people have this ability. They, they have it, they've shown it in the past, they have it in the present, they don't need to acquire it. It's not something that needs to be taught. There's no account really in Blanqui of, of a kind of imputed consciousness that you might find in Lukács or, or needing to find true class consciousness from without that you might see in, in Lenin. There is an account about how we have to overcome uh, ideological miseducation, and I'm gonna come back to that towards the end here. But he assumes that people already have the capacity that they need. Uh, and it's not something that needs to be inculcated in them or you know, forced down their throats in some way or brought in from outside. Um, he further assumes, and this is the last thing to say on this point, is that this is how this is the, the underlying reality of the situation. There's a, there's a war between the rich and the poor. The poor are ready to fight and can win. So even when it doesn't look like it, even when it looks like things are stable and that the people are resigned and passive, that's an illusion. It's not actually the case. So when you look out over maybe the early 1840s, late 1830s, and see what seems to be a relatively pacified society with Paris relatively quiet, Blanqui never believes that that's actually the case. He says, and it's a line I think is quite useful. He says, quote, nothing is so deceptive as a situation because nothing is so changeable. That's a nice line, I think. It's a line that South would have liked as well. So you look at a situation, seems like it's one way or another, it looks like people are resigned and passive, but actually it's not the case. It's not really that people are thus, it's more that, well, the opportunity hasn't yet arisen, people are waiting. So that's, that's Blanqui's basic uh, uh, optimism, if you like. But he does come to recognize uh, after 1830, after July, and in particular after a very quick, forceful, well-organized kind of counter-revolution or usurping of power that sets in, that's set in motion immediately after those days of July, whereby those bankers, the, the bankers, the financiers and others take power for themselves and set up a, a new regime under Louis Philippe, I'm sure you know this history, to avoid the threat of a mass Republican movement and to maintain power basically within the status quo and very literally then replacing one Bourbon King with another. Uh, he's struck by that. And he's struck by the fact that there's no effective popular follow-up to that usurpation. So the main attempt to contest it is the, the failed revolution of or insurrection of June 1832. That's the, the one you have to sort of say this because it's uh, famously the one that evoked by Victor Hugo in Les Miserables. Uh, so doomed insurrection, poorly organized uh, and defeated quite easily by the, by the forces of the government. And the experience of that failure, and it lands Blanqui in prison, and it uh, has real consequences for the movement that he's part of, uh, leads him to recognize three things. And these three things will define the rest of his life. Um, he recognizes that, that uh, uh, so I'll just list them quickly, that, the, that people need a, a, a more effective military strategy as the state has learned its lesson after 1830. And this will become acutely important in 1848 and then again in 1871. So it needs a more effective military strategy. B, it needs, the popular movement needs political leaders who will not betray it. So political leaders who can actually seize and retain power, who can actually do what Lenin and the Bolsheviks will help the Soviets do in 1917. That's the second thing. And third, it needs a way to break the grip of prevailing miseducation or ideological power, the power in particular for Blanqui, the power exerted by the church. Blanqui becomes more and more obsessed with breaking that educational power of, of the church. 
So I'll just kind of go through these things and that will that will end our discussion of Blanqui. Um, so he does, although he's very impressed, as I said, by the experience of, um, of July 1830, he does come to realize that an army that's that plays its cards better than Marmont had done in July 1830. So an army that knows how to use its advantages is a real opponent that people have to um, organize themselves to defeat. And the, the real lesson here is the June days of 1848. So the, if you know that sequence, the revolution then starts in February, there's a period of sort of uncertain tension between whether it's gonna go left or right, and it goes sharply right. And that is, uh, in, and it's confirmed by the fact that the little gesture to the left, the, the, the opening of national workshops for the workers is, are shut down, they're compromised and then shut down uh, by June 1848. And that provokes a, an uprising in the working class quarters of Paris, the so-called June days, which is mercilessly crushed by General Cavignac, who doesn't make either of the three mistakes made by Marmont, doesn't spread out his forces too much, doesn't send them out in little isolated columns, doesn't just stay in a defensive crouch at headquarters. Instead, what he does and what uh, then Thiers and, and uh, McMahon will do in 1871 when they crush the commune is that they retreat out of Paris briefly, the army pulls back out of Paris and then attacks it like an enemy uh, opponent, like a, so as an invading force from without. So the strategy that Cavagnac uses is to pull back out of Paris, concentrate all their forces and then annihilate the major centers of popular resistance one at a time. So the strategy is very simple. You take your artillery, you go, you go, you see there's a range of barricades and uh, neighborhoods that are that are armed and, and in an insurrection. And rather than try to tackle them all at the same time, they just concentrate all their forces on one target at a time and annihilate them all with the cannon. So grape shot just blast through each of these barricades. And fatally, the people do not respond appropriately. Rather than themselves then find a way of confronting this concentrated military force, they hold their ground, each of them in their own quartier, each of their own neighborhood. Blanqui is really disgusted by this. He says, you know, people sit around courageously, yes, but smoking their pipes, listening to the artillery fire in the neighboring quartier, you know, the neighboring neighborhood and do nothing about it and just wait their turn and say, well, everyone has to, you know, hold their ground and, it's up to each, each neighborhood to do their best kind of thing. And that's a recipe for suicide. So Blanqui writes about this repeatedly, but particularly in his instructions for an armed insurrection, late 1860s, which circulates and provides a kind of advice about how, how to uh, address this and how in particular to avoid making that mistake. So he says, if you're gonna get in a fight again with an army that has new rifles and grape shot and, and particularly after Haussmann has, has kind of rearranged Paris to make it very artillery friendly, if you like, very army friendly, uh, the people need to respond with something comparable, an, an organized centralized command structure that can confront the army and defeat it and not take up the suicidal strategy of everyone on their own barricade in their own neighborhood. And fatally, the Paris Commune does not take this advice. And it is really the main reason why they're annihilated in due course in, um, in May 1871. Don't forget, you know, 20,000 or so people killed as a result and more afterwards in the, <clears throat> the crackdown. Um, so that's the first thing that uh, Blanqui says, is that if you are going to get into an armed conflict with, the, uh, with, the, with an army, well, then you need, to, you need to develop a strategy for winning. The second thing then is we have to resist usurpation of victory. Whether people can win, we have to make sure that the, the victory is not usurped by an alternative faction of the ruling class. So by the bankers and financiers of July 1830, or by the moderate Republicans exemplified by Ledru, Rollin, Lamartine, and Pierre-Marie, and the various other sort of soft Republicans of the spring of 1848. And then we'll have the figure of Kerensky in 1917 and the provisional government, and then Ebert and others in Germany in 1918, 1919, and dot, 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 you know, the whole line, the kind of long line of people who will use mass pressure, but only as a way of re, re kind of jigging the prevailing status quo and finding always ways of deflecting that pressure 
using it, but then usurping the mass power that had been organized. And again, here, it's really July 1830, that's the paradigm. You have this extraordinary mass up uprising, very powerful, uh, driven very largely by a demand and desire for a new republic that is instead co-opted and usurped by people who are determined to avoid a republic at all costs. And figures like Lafayette and a few others play a very important role in doing this. And Blanqui is implacably hostile to this tendency of, of a kind, the kind of moderate progressive faction of the ruling class, its tendency to take to, to use and then discard popular power. Again, you could say arguably it's a similar type of thing with, with someone like Obama, Tony Blair, perhaps, if, again, if, depending on how optimistic you are about such parties. So uh, Blanqui then will spend quite a lot of his polemic, polemical energy raging against these figures, people like Ledoux, Roland, Adolphe Thiers in particular. Um, uh, and that then will be a theme that will run. We need reliable leaders then who will not betray the movement. And this is something again that the Bolsheviks in particular, but the whole R Russian Revolutionary Party, I think takes very much to heart. And what would it mean? What kind of leadership do we need? How, how can we prepare ourselves so that if the opportunity for taking power arises, we can indeed take it. And it will just parenthetically be a major theme in 1917. You might know it's one of the most famous episodes in that sequence in the, the so-called July days, 1917, when there's a kind of preemptive and quickly failed insurrection um, that briefly looks like it might be pushing power into the hands of the Soviets. There's a moment when the, the leader, the moderate leader Chernoff, socialist revolutionary, um, is confronted by an angry crowd saying, take power, you son of a bitch, when it's given to you. And Chernoff backs off and says, we're not ready, we can't do it. Um, and the, the Soviet leadership had, was broadly dominated by people who didn't think they were ready, that it was premature, that they, that they had to wait. And Lenin's whole position already from April is that we're ready, we're ready. Uh, we're, the people aren't perhaps themselves entirely ready, but we are ready when the opportunity comes, we will be ready. And in October, we are we are going to be ready and we will do what is necessary to ready ourselves. And that's very much taking, I think, Blanqui's um, point to heart. Um, and the third thing then that, so Blanqui said, so we need a new, we need an effective and actually adequate military strategy if you're gonna get into a fight. And that could be, by the way, I just wanna stress that for us, I, I think the days in which you can actually win these kinds of things with you know, pikes and muskets and so on are long gone. You're not going to win a fight against the state armed with things like, you know, kamikaze drones and the sorts of surveillance and other kind of military means that the state, like the British state or the American state has at its disposal. You're not going to win a struggle like that with weapons. But what kind of strategy can you develop that, that makes those weapons unusable? What kind of mass force do you need to actually overcome the forces of the state. That remains, I think, a very pertinent question. Um, so an effective actual strategy for winning a struggle. You need a leadership that will not betray it. And you need, finally, uh, adequate means of addressing the way in which people have been miseducated and encouraged to accept the prevailing status quo of things. You need ways, in other words, of, of winning the ideological fight. And this becomes Blanqui's in increasing focus in the last decades of his life. And why? Well, because he sees what happens in 1848. In, in 1848, again, a similar type of thing. February, you have a mass insurrection. It overwhelms the forces of order. You have a clique of moderate Republicans, in this case now, people who, who recognize you can't continue on with the monarchy, but who are nevertheless keen to limit the damage, in fact, to the ruling class, come in, and co-op things, and they do it by now by engineering an election, a quick, hastily organized election, which they run on Easter Sunday, so the 23rd of April, 19, 1848. And it's almost as if they did it deliberately to give the church and the, you know, the established power in the provinces of France every opportunity to win the election for the moderate conservative forces in the country, who, of course, are still a very powerful group. So the election is held on the basis of universal suffrage, but with very little preparation. There's no time to, for serious campaigning. We're talking literally a couple of weeks. Communication is slow. And Blanqui's point then 
which he tries to make with a mass, he helps organize a mass protest, literally about 100,000 people pressure the government not to do this, to delay the elections. Blanqui says, we've been miseducated for you know, decades, if not centuries. We need at least a year, maybe more, for genuine political discussion to break the monopoly that the church largely has over intellectual life in the, in the countryside, to have a, the chance for what Gramsci would call you know, a new, a real political collective will to take shape through all the discussion, argument, debate, and so on that, that, that requires. And only through that can we have something like a genuinely free decision and thus free, genuinely free elections. And the last point I wanna make here is that Blanqui thinks that that process of breaking the grip of prevailing miseducation must be a revolutionary process. So here is where he's very much in sync with people like Luxembourg and Lenin and against people like Bernstein and others. Uh, he says that it's only a revolutionary shift that can shatter the power of the established order of things, that the power of established order is so imposing, it's so impressive, just by the simple fact of it being established, that only something like a revolutionary, a revolution, a kind of fragmentation of that power, a collapse of that power, can actually open up something like a new possibility. And I, I want to end with just a few quotations here. And a lot of these are, I, if, uh, if, if you want to find them in one spot, I, I put them into a response I wrote, a little trivial little response I wrote to William Clare Roberts a few years ago in the journal Jacobin. So if you were just to look for that, it's probably the only piece on Blanqui and Jacobin, I'm not sure. Um, You'll find them all there. It's, uh, and these are just quotations that compiled from what he says about revolution. It's always the same point, which is that revolution alone can really break the deadlock that prevails and that maintains the existing order of things. So it's not that revolutionaries know what to do in the new world or have some kind of cookbook for the future or a blueprint that they're going to just apply. It says, no, nobody has that. We, we don't know. No one knows the secrets of the future. But only the revolution, and this is all quotations now, only the revolution in clearing the terrain will reveal the horizon, will slowly lift the veil, will open up the various routes that lead to the new order. You know, we know in theory, he says, that of course it's gonna require an end to the reign of exploitation, it'll involve the emancipation of the workers, it'll involve creating a new social order that will free labor from the tyranny of capital. You know, all of that again is self-evident for Blanqui. But how to do it, that's what's not clear. And he says, nothing illuminates the way, nothing lifts the veil of the horizon, nothing resolves social problems like a great social upheaval because participation in that upheaval itself is transformative. Only a revolution can do this. And why? Because the established order is a barrier that conceals the future from us, covers it in an almost impenetrable fog. We need to get rid of that fog. Again, he says, all the powers of thought, all the greatest efforts of intelligence are unable to anticipate this creative phenomenon. It can break out at any moment, but only the revolution can do it. You can prepare the cradle, he says, but not bring to life the long awaited being. Sort of like a, a way of saying that, that those kind of birthing metaphors uh, that Marx likes are not adequate. There's something else that would, that's required, which is the revolution itself. A revolution, he says, improvises more ideas in one day than the previous 30 years were able to wrest from the brains of a thousand thinkers, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, he goes on and on about this. So the revolution itself is transformative. It itself allows for a, a kind of break in the prevailing ideas, the kind of ruling order and ruling ideas of things. And there is no substitute for it. And that then is the, really the last point I wanted to make about Blanqui. And, and I think I've stopped there. It's already 45 minutes, I realize. And we can see if you would like to talk about this a bit in the context of 1917. Uh, the, the main point I want to make there is that I think Lenin's arguments in favor of taking power in October 1917 are very much in line with Blanqui, except that he adds another element to the equation, which is not typical of Blanqui, which is that he is that uh, Lenin, I think, equivocates between saying, this is, a, this is a, an exercise in mass sovereignty. The transfer of all power to the Soviets is a way of fulfilling the will of the people, which is a, the terms that are in fact very consistently used all through the 
the summer and autumn of 1917. So to transfer all power to the Soviets is to fulfill the will of the people. And in that sense, it's a, it's a classic example of a revolution undertaken in order to transfer mass sovereignty to the people at large, organized now through these Soviets and councils. But Lenin adds to that um, the idea that the form of this revolution uh, will be a proletarian form, and that the form of the government that will exercise power for the people will be a proletarian dictatorship. So a dictatorship of the proletariat, leading in hegemonic style, the great mass of the peasantry and working people. And that proletarian uh, dictatorship is underwritten by historical logic, by the movement of development of capitalism in Russia and, and in the rest of the world. That, as far as Lenin's concerned along classic Marxist lines, guarantee, if you like, the future orientation and development of class struggle. It will guarantee the ultimate victory of the proletariat and ensure then the triumph of socialism. And it will do this first and foremost then in the places where that development is most advanced. So not in Russia, but in Europe, in Germany in particular. So that the justification for taking power is grounded now not in the capacity necessarily of just the Russian actors themselves, but a wager on proletarian capacity more broadly, specifically in Germany. So a great part of the logic that Lenin and Trotsky in particular emphasize is we are doomed if, if Germany loses. And that's a step that Blanqui would never have taken, I think. First of all, he doesn't have anything like that, uh, that historical underlying logic of the kind of inexorable tendencies of capital that must lead to self-destruction or that must push history in a certain direction. He's, he's, he, he does not, I think, share Marx's determinism, at least that dimension of Marx's determinism. And there's no part of Blanqui that would have trusted anybody else, that would have relied on something happening elsewhere what matters, what is fundamental is what can we do? What can the, what can the people in this situation do? And there I think, uh, this is why I have Martov in the title of this talk. This is where Blanqui also resonates a bit with Martov, is that Martov, and I, I we really probably should stop there because there's too much to say about Martov, but Mar Martov does not agree with Lenin on this, on this point. He thinks that the proletariat is not ready, in fact, in Russia, and I think he's right about that. The proletariat is still small, the, 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 what, what Lenin is calling the dictatorship of the proletariat is in fact, I think Martov is right, is in fact more the mobilizing of peasants in uniform. So the, the dominant political force are the demobilized or currently more or less mutinous soldiers who are largely peasants, some workers as well. They are the people with real political initiative in the capital cities of Russia and Moscow and, and Petrograd. But it's not a classic Marxian proletarian figure of a mass majority, the great majority of people aligned through proletarianization onto a single political platform. That's not the case in Russia. And Martov is right about that. And it will have very significant consequences then for the attempt to push that through, which he rightly can see will only be able to be done through top-down pressure and thus through clientelism and increasingly through terror. And so Martov predicts really quite accurately, unfortunately, what will happen as a result of attempts to do that. Um, and so that's where 1917 then is this great ambiguous sequence and why its ambiguity will be so consequential for the rest of the 20th century. On the one hand, I think a, a legitimate, and if you like, almost classically Blanquist exercise of mass sovereignty, but in another way, a preemptive and failed attempt at a proletarian dictatorship. And I'll, I'll stop there. I'll unmute myself. Thank you uh, very much, Peter. That was terrific. Uh, right. OK, we've got half an hour for uh, questions, uh, comments and the like. Uh, it would be great if you could turn your cameras on, actually, and then we can actually have this sense that we're actually involved in a real seminar where we're actually talking to, to each other. Um, that, that would be great. So thank you for doing that, uh, Andreas. Um, so uh, there's a question in the chat already. Uh, well, shall we begin with that? We might as well. Uh, uh, I, from Oliver, I think. Oliver Dodd. Uh, hi. Uh, Oliver's question is, can you say something about what you think are the weaknesses in Blanqui's thought? Uh, I think you've perhaps already touched a little bit on that. But uh, anyway, there we are. Well, that's a question. So 
Yeah. yeah. So a couple of things. One, one is that he that because he has that experience in July 1830, he's too confident about the 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 willingness of people to rise up. You know, without needing much organization, without you know, without really having to prepare it. So that leads him to take really reckless decisions. He he's involved in particular in May 1839 in a, in an attempted insurrection. And then there'll be another one in um, in 1870, and then and uh, and. And they're not properly prepared. They're too secretive. He has to be secretive because they're in a, they're living in a working in a police state. But they're so narrowly secretive that they they just don't do any of the basic legwork to prepare things. And and that that's what at least a defeat. And as a result, he spends half his life in jail. And and um, you could argue that his his immediate legacy that way is one of defeat and and division. You know, so that's a a, a serious problem. He doesn't pay enough attention. To the fact that not only do you need a better military strategy, but you'd also need a better political strategy. You need something like the, the equivalent of some, uh, say, the Jacobin clubs or the new political parties that are starting to take shape in the 1870s and 80s. So, you, you, you know, the, something like the SPD, the German Social Democratic Party, will become the paradigmatic attempt to organize something like mass collective pressure and, and a very important model then for the Russian parties and for other parties. And Blanqui has no interest in that, really. Doesn't think it's necessary. Um, so that's, I think, a limitation. Um, then I think his analysis of capital, I think, although part of me does kind of like the way he's so, he says, well, of course, exploitation. Yes, it's obvious. Um, there's another way in which I think he could go further. He doesn't talk very much about commodification or, or the full, say, the, the way that fetishism of commodities will, will run so deeply, you know, into, the, into just people's general political psychology and the real full consequences of that. Again, Blanqui doesn't pay much attention, thinks it's sort of obvious. Um, and then there are other things. He's quite, he's, he's pretty misogynistic. He becomes increasingly misogynistic. He thinks women are dominated by the church. And as he becomes more and more you know, bitter about the church, he starts to say absurdly misogynistic things in his late writing. He's got some anti-Semitic tropes that he pulls out on occasion. You know, he's not very uh, mindful of the French colonial presence in the world. He becomes increasingly chauvinistic, he's very bitterly anti-German. Uh, so he, he will indulge in all kinds of stereotypes in the, in the Franco-Prussian war. So uh, he's not, his internationalism is underdeveloped. You know, so there's a lot of limitations that way. But, um, but still, I, I think it's also to be fair to him, important to retain you know, what's powerful about him. Great, thank you very much. So uh, do we have any more questions? So, uh, Kim, yes, okay. <laughs> Go I'm ahead. Raising my real hand. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. For, this has been an excellent presentation and very informative. Um, I, wa I wanted to point out what seems to be a contradiction because uh, you describe Blanqui as um, wanting to break miseducation and have people informed. Uh, but at the same time, he apparently had the opposite idea that people already had the capacity to organize or to take action. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seems to be a little bit of a contradiction there. And I know this is sort of outside of your, your talk, but I'm thinking of present the present time all around the world where we're seeing a rise of neo-fascism and they seem to be a little bit more organized than some, some entity we like to call the left. Yeah. So I wonder if you or maybe anybody else had some ideas about that. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's a great question, Kim. And, and I'm, Yes, it's, it's a partly a chrono chronological thing. So I think in 1830, and in the 1830s in general, he's still, Blanqui's um, confident that, that what happened in July, and Blanqui, by the way, had himself been involved in other smaller insurrections already in 1827, and when he's very young, um, only in his own, in his 20s, um, he's carried by the kind of elan or the enthusiasm of that and thinks that um, the question of miseducation is not such a central issue. Um, and all that really needs to be done is that the boot has to be taken off the neck of the workers, really. And, and there are rebellions all through the 1830s. It's important to remember that there are rebellions in Lyon and in, in um, other French 
towns, uh, and that rebellion is very present, you know, it's bubbling away. Um, and so I think he's not so concerned about the question of a, a miseducation, if you like, then. Um, but by 1848, he's become more pessimistic. So something happens over the course of that decade where um, he, he thinks that this, that that now we need, maybe he's just become more impressed by the power of ideology or, or, or I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure if there's a pivotal moment or, but by, by already by 1840, he's had the experience of defeat several times. So a, a very, the, the big sequence that he puts the most energy into is May 1839, which is a, 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 a they take over the, the it, it, it's an insurrection in Paris that lasts for a couple of days. They take over the Hotel de Ville, the, the town hall, and I think the Ministry of Justice, and they get, a, they make a certain amount of progress and then they're defeated. And he has to ask himself, well, why did people not rise up? You know, what, what, why wasn't there more? Why wasn't it like July 1830? Um, and he can see that that there's not there's not a lot of reasons to be very hopeful, even as things get worse in the 1840s, which is a difficult decade for a lot of people and quite a lot of poverty and so on. So I think by 1848, he thinks we need, we, you know, we need also to challenge the grip of the status quo more forcefully. And that's where he'd become more and more preoccupied then by the question of, of miseducation and by the need to delay the elections and for proper political campaigning. It's also that in the moment of 1848 where he can go from conspiratorial politics to open politics. So up until then, you know, Blanquies absolutely wants to pursue you know, open revolution, but you can only do that with a tiny group of people that you trust. So just like the Bolsheviks under the Tsar, um, you need to be conspiratorial or else you know, suicide. Um, and and he's, he's influenced here by the Carbonari legacy and other things. Um, but in 1848, things can shift. So in February, he's, he's freed. He'd been in prison for a, a decade. He, he, uh, there can be open political campaigning. So he forms an open political club that called the, I think it was the, it has a different name, but everybody called it the, the, the Club Blanqui. And they hold open debates and meetings. And it's, I think, also partly through that, that now there's, there's a lot of, the, the press has exploded. There's a lot of political discussion. And he's struck by the naivete of people. Who, who, are, who think that it'll be enough to just have a show of mass force and that that will win the election, for example, or that will push the government to do a certain kind of thing. There's, there are a couple of attempts in April, and then in, the main one is in the middle of May, where a large gathering of people, tens of thousands of people, go and march on the National Assembly and try to impose their will on it, try to force it to do something. So the, the major one is the 15th or 16th of, of May uh, in 1848, and a huge crowd of people go and they invade the assembly. They're trying to push in particular a change of policy about Poland um, and some other things around the workshop, the national workshops. But they have no good plan. So they go in. Blanqui doesn't think it's a good idea. He tags along because he thinks, well, better to be, you know, maybe we can salvage something. But in fact, it's indecisive. It's poorly done. It's not well organized. And the National Guard rallies in defense of the regime and they crush, they basically disperse the people. And then they arrest all the leaders, including Blanqui. Um, and they destroy the left, in fact, decapitate it right there. And from then on, Blanqui will say, you know, we really, people need to learn some lessons from this. And, and what he will write about later, perhaps the main example is a text called Communism, the Future of Society, which is a text from the late 60s, I think. Again, it's on that website, like all the others, where he'll emphasize education and education, you know, and over and over, including just basic education. So get rid of the church, have no, he says, nobody in a black robe should be allowed anywhere near children. Um, <laughs> destroy, you know, eliminate the church's role in education and have just good universal free egalitarian education that teaches basic science and how the world works. And he was very hopeful that that by itself would be a revolutionary thing. Thank you very much, Peter. Kim, before we move on, I noticed you put something in the chat about uh, Iran. I, I wasn't quite sure why you did that. Oh, Could you yeah, be, explain that? Sort of because Peter had mentioned um, the, the more modern um, situation that we're all involved in, where he mentioned, you know, it would be impossible to go out in the streets these days and build barricades and have clubs mm -hmm. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, article I just saw today, and I haven't even read the whole thing, but the title was Hacked Documents. Some documents were found 
And it's about Iran and it's how Iran can track and control protesters' phones. So it's all about technological surveillance and how how bad it's, it's getting. I mean, you know, the, we're talking here about Iran, but it can be global. Sure. Yeah. So I, I wanted to post that in there. Right, it's a good point. And, and, and then, I mean, you think how courageous people were in Hong Kong, for example. Uh, I mean, there may be situations where still, I still think a map, uh, there's real power in numbers and um, strategically, I think mass, you know, nonviolent strategies are more effective. They're just they're just harder to police and harder to contain. Um, but I think, particularly as things go down the lines that we're seeing them, to, you know, very rapidly going down. Particularly the use of those small drones, and um, I don't really see how you could contest that. You know, and I think Blanqui himself, the question is how to win. So, um, how do you how do you defeat the state? armed with these kinds of things. I don't really see how to do it. Um, and, and my guess is that Bunky would say, well, those are the wrong weapons to use. Um, you mentioned the other part of your question, Tim, was about how I, I how it's the right, you know, the, and often the far right that's usurped this whole logic of, of in a way of, of insurgency and of, of, of kind of co-opting a whole part of at least of the, of the revolutionary rhetoric. And that itself is, yeah, very, I think, a very troubling thing. And it does have a neo-fascistic dimension to it, unquestionably. And for the same kind of reason, a kind of usurping over of, of a socialist tradition and using it against, yeah, against us. And I think um, that it does call for a new kind of internationalism and a new way of thinking about the, like, these power dynamics. Um, Thank you very much. So do we have any more questions? Perhaps I, 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 I'll chip in then. I, I, I've got lots of questions. I don't, don't want to. Do, do. Andres, Andres Beeler. Oh, Andres. I'm, I'm sorry, Andres. Right. Okay, go on. Off you go. Only you can go first. You still have. No, 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 no. I, 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 I would just, uh, I mean, there's this idea of learning from events over time, and you make this link, Peter. It was an excellent presentation. Very much enjoyed it. Thank mm. you. You made these links between uh, 1917 and Blompi. It, is there any evidence that Lenin actually had read Blanqui and then thought, okay, I'm going to apply those lessons, or how, how or is perhaps the learning not that direct? I I don't know if he'd read much. He does talk about it a little bit. So one of the things on that Blanqui archive, I don't mean to sound like I'm pushing this thing too much, but um <laughs> that Blanqui archive, if you go to it, we've spent quite a lot of time trawling through various things, uh, compiling what people had said. So Trotsky is, the, is more supportive. Trotsky has some actually appreciative things to say in his history of the Russian Revolution and some other places too. Generally, someone like Rosa Luxemburg always critical of Blanqui as far as I can remember. Lenin a little more nuanced, like he is about Robespierre and the Jacobins. And he won't always take the Jacobin label as an insult. Sometimes he says, yeah, we're, what is a, a Russian social democrat is a, is a Jacobin who's also anti-capitalist and who's read Marx and who's ready to do what, what, what it, what's required in our situation. Um, but I don't know if, my guess is that Lenin had, wouldn't have read much Blanqui, but what he had read and studied about in a lot of detail was the Paris Commune. And there, what Marx and broadly, Bakunin too, and Blanqui all say broadly the same thing, which is the Paris Commune failed because A, it didn't deal with the, with the power of the bankers and the financiers and capital essentially. So it didn't, the Paris Commune does not, you know, doesn't take over the, the National Bank of France and doesn't get control of finance and credit and capital basically on that level. And instead just leaves the Bank of France, you know, to continue operating and in fact takes out loans from the Bank of France, which Thiers himself approves, it can't quite believe probably that this is happening. But um, so that's the first thing you've got to deal with capital, you've got to deal with capital, capital flight, this constant, you know, which is such a problem for us still, right? The constant kind of blackmail of the threat of capital flight, which destroys every left all, you know, alternative all over the world. And that has to be faced directly. So, and, and you remember in the Communist Manifesto and then in Lenin repeatedly, one of the first things to do in the, in the, the to-do list is take over the banks, take over. So get a grip on capital. That's, so that's the first lesson that I think Lenin takes from uh, the commune, which would have been a very Blanquist one. And the second is, go on the offensive. So the major mistake that the, and it's heartbreaking, 
mistake because the, literally the day of the commune starts and eight, is it the 18th of March, there's a debate about in the National Guard, so the, the kind of little group of National Guard leaders who are effectively the, the, the sovereign power now, argue about whether the first thing they should do is organize elections for what will become the commune, or whether they should march immediately on Versailles on the, on the so-called legitimate government and, and, and defeat it. And, they, and the Blanquis all argue for that. They all say, we have to go to Versailles today, like immediately. And we have the momentum, we have the force, we have the, all the energy. The government in Paris is an illegitimate government. It's a mon essentially a monarchist government. It, it was elected, but it was elected in the very particular context of defeat in the hands of Prussia. The army is still largely, in fact, prisoners of war. So a lot of the troops have not come back yet from the places where they were holed up or had been imprisoned by the Germans. And the morale is very low. And, and Thiers, the, the head of this government, had just made a major mistake in trying to take the cannons off the, off the This is what you know, triggers the commune. They tried to go and disarm the National Guard. And that blows up in their face. And now the whole mass of Paris, you know, people of Paris are, have risen up against the government and are ready to fight the government. But no order is given to fight the government. Instead, they just stay in the defensive crouch, essentially. And that, Lenin says, is a fatal error. It's also a thing that Marx emphasizes in his civil war in France. And that Blanqui was now in prison himself, but if he could have, that would have made him tear his hair out. He would have, um, he would have said, we have to go instantly on the attack. We have to organize a, a proper force and, and beat this government. And so Lenin takes that lesson to heart. And you probably know the famous anecdote that the day after the, the, the government, the, the new Soviet government lasted longer than the Paris Commune, Lenin goes out into the snow and celebrates you know, with a little dance. Um, and, and there's something about that that's kind of quite symbolic about, about you know, Lenin's whole project. And in that sense, it is a very Blanquist one. The, the, other, the thing that makes him very different though is that his understanding of how the proletariat is both the forming of a political, a kind of political will, and he uses that terminology, so does Trotsky, um, which is quite Blanquist, I think, but also uh, that, it's, that, that that political psychological dimension goes hand in hand with this underlying economic determinist dimension. The proletariat, if you know that in these, this side of Marx, where Marx will say early and late that it doesn't really matter what the proletariat wants or what this or that proletarian wants, what matters is what the proletariat is and what it will thus be compelled to do by simply by what it is and the way capital will force it and will organize it, will train it, will concentrate it as a force. And Lenin is, and like all his generation, very struck by that side of Marx, that scientific socialist prediction of proletarian victory by analyzing what the proletariat is rather than what the proletariat wants. And the difference between them then as I see it is it's not that Lenin pays no attention to what the proletariat wants. He, he focuses on political will uh, quite a lot, but that he, he, he supplements it with this underlying sort of political economic ontology of what the proletariat is and must be. And that introduces a, a dimension of determinism. Blanqui might call it a fatalism even, that, that essentially just kind of orients the outcome of the struggle in advance. And Blanqui has no equivalent of this. He, he, that business about victory, do you remember at the beginning that it's victory that decides whether you win or lose, it decides right, there's no fatalism, there's no inevitable victory of socialism, there's no grave diggers who are, you know, all assembling around capital's cadaver or anything like that. It's a straight political fight with no underlying kind of economic determinist safety net. And I, in my opinion, I mean, what people will regularly point to this as a weakness of Blanqui and of Rousseau for that matter, and say Marx, you know, more important because he has this underlying materialist analysis of the class dynamics that will explain why the proletariat will win. But I think, in fact, it is it is a virtue of both Rousseau and Blanqui that they don't have that dimension, and there's therefore no shortcut to the work, the political organizing work of shaping mass power into something that is indeed powerful. That and, and that that if you're going to pick out a historical point of reference for this. The Jacobins or the Blanquis are, are a helpful point of reference, despite the fact that, you know, it's a different world and they have all their limitations and so on, because they don't outsource any of the work to history or the logic of history or economic determinisms or anything like that. Instead, it all boils down to what are we capable of, what are we, what are we prepared to do, 
how can we organize that? How can we act on it? Okay, uh, thank you very much for your question, uh, Andreas. Uh, well, if nobody else is going to, uh, uh, well, I, 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 perhaps I, I could uh, ask one. I, 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 I had the impression that there's a sort of fairly clear evolution in his thinking, at least about some issues. I, I, as over the course of the 19th century, each revolution happens. It obviously has to think about what lessons are to be learned. And it seems to me that in the account that you gave, which I really enjoyed, by the way, I thought it was terrific, uh, his thinking just about some issues just, just seemed to develop. So earlier on, I think you were, you were attributing to him the view that there was a need to seize power. It was later on this, you know, this, uh, this, this notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which you mentioned at the very end of your talk in connection with Lenin rather than with, with Blanqui. But mm -hmm. but the idea there, of course, is that uh, the idea of seizing power doesn't work. We need to uh, smash the existing state machine by, by means of a sort of violent r revolution. And it, 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 the way you told the story of Blanqui's sort of intellectual development, it seemed to me that he sort of uh, he too seemed to be sort of moving away from the idea of seizing power and uh, in the direction of this idea that we do need a violent revolution. We, we need to, uh, as Marx says in the case of the Paris Commune, uh, to smash the existing state machine. So I was just wondering if you could comment on, on that. Uh, yeah, I, it's a little, so it's unfortunate that he doesn't really come up with um, he never, for one thing, he never really has time, but I don't know of, of a, he doesn't give a, a proper postmortem of the Paris Commune, as far as I'm aware, um, mm -hmm. and doesn't try to, you know, distill the lessons of that. And arguably, you could say that the Bolsheviks, that's a large part of what they do, is they study the Paris Commune, they're impressed by it, it's constantly pu pulled out in some of the polemics between Martov and Lenin, for example, of who is more faithful to the Paris Commune mm -hmm. in its way of, you know, disbanding the state, the state's army and police, and, and having, you know, the government run by people who are just paid regular workers' wages, of having a you know very responsive government uh, that can be recalled at any time, you know putting workers' issues first, etc. Um, they they all kind of compete to see you know who who can best put this into practice, but who can also avoid its mistakes. So who can make sure that the Paris Commune will not you know our version of the Commune will not be overrun. Um, but Blanqui, I don't know if, if he I'm not aware of anywhere where he does this systematically. He He's in prison again until I can't remember. Is it seventy-eight? So he spends so much of his time in prison. He's if, if talk about that's another major difference with Marx. Marx, although he's exiled repeatedly and has to you know really struggle to make it, just put food on the table, he is nevertheless able to spend a lot of his time in the library, in the you know in the British Library, and study and systematically go through things and has the you know the periodical press available and uh, and Blanqui most of the time doesn't. So he's he's really thrown back on his own resources and often in solitary confinement. The fact that he survives at all um, is really kind of remarkable, actually. Um, so he doesn't have the kind of conditions in which you could come up with a fully developed theory, really, of how of how of how this might go. Generally speaking, what he emphasizes is the the last point that I made that we don't really know what will happen after the revolution, but we can trust the revolution essentially. Because what does a revolution do? It mobilizes a mass of people. Do you remember these lines? You get the, the pref Trotsky's preface to the uh, history of the Russian Revolution. And Lenin will say this some, somewhere else too. That what is a revolution? It's, it's a it's a mass. It's a kind of radical, sudden shift in from mass passivity and submission to mass action and participation. That that suddenly, in a way that we hadn't expected, all sorts of avenues open up for mass participation in something like the shaping of our own destiny. And that is what Blanqui wages everything on. And we can trust that without knowing necessarily what people will do with that opportunity, but we can trust it. And we can trust it partly because we've had the experience in 1792, 93 of, although very fraught and certainly in the context of the civil war of extraordinary achievements, again, with limitations, but you know, abolition of slavery and these steps towards the beginning of, of universal mass education and abolition of all feudal privilege and the establishment of legal equality and you know quite significant achievements um, and uh, and then and the development for example of those Jacobin clubs and of all the sans culottes uh, uh, forms of self-organization that really did shape Paris and have changed it completely from a place that had been politically silent and submissive 
to one that was very actively self-determining. And the more you look into that in detail, what happened in the neighborhoods like Saint Antoine and Saint Marcel, there are very good histories of this. In those years, you can see what Blanqui is on about, that these are places that went in the space of a couple of years from being politically completely pacified and, and um, with no real political voice at all to being extremely politically articulate and effective and organized and capable and able then to do something like uh, take power on the 10th of August, 92, and then keep it. Um, so Blanc that's what Blanqui is confident in, is that the revolution will break this inertia that we're in the fog that covers the status quo, that keeps us all in the state of passivity and, and makes us feel that, well, as very much the case for us, if we were to challenge the grip of capital, you know, the world would fall apart. Um, and Blanqui um, says and believes that no, a revolution will come and can come and it will break that fog and it will open up a door to mass capacity. And he says it would be folly for us to think, to anticipate what people will do in that situation, because they will be better qualified, they will be more, act you know, they will be smarter, more active, more aware, better organized. That's not our problem. Our problem is, as you say, to try to smash the existing order of things, mm -hmm. to take a pickaxe to the existing order. That's a metaphor he uses a few times mm -hmm. and to keep go to, to do whatever it is required to do that, to keep banging away until eventually that opportunity presents itself. So, and that's, that's in a way what he has this, this line where he says the duty of a revolution is just to struggle and to keep struggling no matter what. Keep banging away with that pickaxe and trust that eventually then the that this just you know awful um, existing structure will start to collapse hmm. and trust that as it collapses they will open up new possibilities. I, I was going to say something else if, if nobody else I, I don't want to hog the <laughs> Right, but, but, well, nobody else. So I was just wondering another aspect of this thing. When, when I th suggested, I thought it seemed to me the way the way you tell the story, there is some sort of clear evolution in his thinking. Mm -hmm. So an, another aspect of that, I think, would be I had the impression that uh, earlier on, the, he sort of he's a sort of spontaneist. I think when it comes to uh, yeah. whereas later he seems to sort of uh, uh, the way you tell the story anyway. After eighteen forty eight, he he comes to appreciate the need for organization and leadership perhaps more than rely just on the, the spontaneous revolutionary energy of the masses or the, or the people that sort of uh, we, we do need to get organized. Uh, is that uh, is that correct? Yeah, it is, but it's limited also. So I it is. So he already after eighteen thirty. So. Um, a group starts to form in the immediate months. I think it's called the Society for the of the Friends of the Republic, and they they start to organize a conspiratorial um, uh, kind of group with all kinds of secrecy, and um, and then they form another one, Society of the Seasons, and the, there's a, a couple of these kind of secret societies that that try to that create a, a small, very dedicated group of people who will be able to lead at least a new revolutionary upsurge and if it wins would be able to be trust you know trustworthy if you like in terms of securing the initial power and setting up typically they say setting up the conditions in which you could have a real constituent assembly or a real constituent process that would be itself a mass process um, and that that remains the model through the 1830s it fails repeated you know fails several times and then he's in prison um, and then under Napoleon III they have a a kind of they go back to this drawing board and develop an, another kind of conspiratorial um, approach that takes shape. He's let out of prison finally in, in 1866 or so. He goes to Brussels and they organize again a small group, but it's only a couple of hundred people really, who start spreading, for example, uh, versions of that pamphlet about instru in the instructions for an armed uprising. It's just a, a text that circulates in manuscript and unofficially and preparing the ground for a new insurrection, but it remains um, still a, a small conspiratorial group and not, in terms of say, comp nothing comparable to what the social democratic parties in Germany or Russia will try to do. Um, and he doesn't, either he, he doesn't think it's, I can't, I couldn't really tell you whether he thinks it's not really necessary because of course people will rise up against Napoleon III or given a chance, um, or whether it's, he doesn't think that it's really feasible to do. Um, because again, you can't organize out in the open. It's too, people are constantly being arrested and um, the conditions are just don't lend themselves to that. Um, and then the question would be, well, what about in the, in the 1870s? So in the Third Republic, when it is a bit more possible, 
but it but the crackdown against the commune had been so devastating. So I, I think the final thing to say about Blanqui's life is that although he never really gives up, the fact is that the left is absolutely decapitated by Thiers. Those 20,000 people killed in the commune, then thousands more are exiled and sent off to the colonies. And they shatter the organization, really. And Blanqui and Blanqui's people, they're almost all killed, the ones of Rigaud and various others who are involved in the uh, in the actual commune itself, or most of them die. And then Blanqui has no network. He's himself in prison. He's now an old man also. That's when he writes his kind of melancholic piece on the eternity by the stars, which is a little overread in my opinion, but um, you can, it's still interesting to look at. And the thing that he starts to focus on increasingly is how to try to stop the movement as he can see it quite clearly towards 1914. So he dies well before that, but he campaigns against the standing army. He campaigns against the, the attempt of the state to kind of rally a new military machine, particularly the standing army is the thing. He says, we must abolish the standing army and, and trust a citizen army. So he's a, he starts to sound a little bit like, anticipate little aspects at least of Jaurès, the Jean Jaurès, um, but without that, again, without that focus on mass organization of the workers. And he's not in that sense, he's like a figure who, whose mental world really is, belongs back in the 1830s, really, more than in the 1870s. And it's, again, it's one of his limitations. I'm afraid we, we, we've run out of time. Um, but I think we should uh, thank Peter for uh, an excellent and uh, engaging uh, seminar. I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much, Peter. Well, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you. Good to see you, Richard. I hope you're all right. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks for all your questions. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. bye, -bye.